on the way into church this morning, saw a good old conservative rural Arizona style big old pickup truck. <laughs> on the back window, it had a bumper sticker that said, Believe in Trump! And I thought, that goes perfect with what I was going to share this morning. So thank you, sir, for that illustration. Now take that off. <laughs> Not that I actually said that to him, because I couldn't have, because he was in a different vehicle. So, I was reading in the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Now when the people saw... Okay, so context, you know the book of Exodus. They leave Egypt... God delivers them from Egypt. They go out and there's the giving of the law. And the giving of the law goes through this process where first the people are kind of more involved in the process. They see God. They hear his voice. They've been told not to touch the mountain. They're terrified. They say, Moses, we can't handle this. You go hear from God and then you tell us. And so we walk through this process. And then it winds up where Moses is up on the mountain hearing directly from Yahweh. And the people are down in, uh, on the plain or wherever they're at, nearby. So, contextually, however, Exodus chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments, which of course includes, thou shalt not make any graven images. That's given in Exodus 20. This is before Moses goes up on the mountain by himself. This is even before Moses and the elders have their experience of the Lord's presence. This is back when, this is before the people say, we will keep the commandments of the Lord. This is, they heard this. They heard the Ten Commandments. Okay, so that is all backdrop. And you can see in chapter, so chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. Chapter 24, verse 3 is, Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. So, there's our, they have heard. That is backdrop to what happens here in chapter 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. Like exactly what God said not to do. Word for word. Make no graven images. So he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, and they said, so this would be the people speaking, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, and listen carefully, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh, to the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So, a couple of observations about this section. Firstly, this apostasy on behalf of the children of Israel is not a complete forsaking of God. It is a complete forsaking in a moral sense. It's completely wrong. But I find it interesting that Aaron makes the calf and then says, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. So this is compromised worship. They're still tied to the name of Yahweh. Yet they've completely abandoned his commandments. The way he said, this is how you worship me. They've completely lost their faith in him. 
They're not willing to wait to hear from him. They want a calf to worship. But they're still, they still have the form. They still have this form, and Aaron's still saying, well, tomorrow will be a feast to Yahweh. Because I'm, you know, Aaron, I'm, I'm the priest of, of Yahweh, and we're still, we're kind of, he's trying to hold on to both. That's how it looks to me. Obviously, he's acting in the fear of man. He is derelict in his duty as a high priest. He should be saying, no, I will not make a calf. What are you thinking? Did you not hear the words of the Lord? Have we not seen his mighty acts? How could we do this wicked thing? But no, Aaron feared man, and because he feared man, he compromised. But, Aaron says, and I, this is sanctified imagination, as we might say. Aaron says, yeah, yeah, so I made a calf, but, but we were still worshiping Yahweh. I mean, we were still going to offer sacrifices to Yahweh. I was still trying to help, you know, I was, I was being um, sensitive to the needs of the people. The calf was an aid to worship. Yes, yes, the calf is just an aid to worship. The people needed that, so I was just helping them in, in their worship of Yahweh. And what does God say in verse 7? Your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. So that was God's perspective on the worship. Compromised worship is corrupt worship. It's unacceptable. It's straight up bad. No matter what justifications Aaron might try to present as the person in authority, the high priest, man called to represent God before the people in a different way than Moses, more really called to represent the people before God. But if anybody other than Moses should be taking a stand here, it should be Aaron. And later on he tells, he tells Moses, well, I, I threw the gold in the, into the fire and out came this calf. No, nope, sorry, you used a graving tool. That, that, that's skilled labor. You spent time on this thing. You worked at it. You worked at creating a compromised religion that would please the people. And it did not please God in the slightest. It didn't fool him for a minute. God called it corrupt. Compromised worship is corrupt worship. So do we see the application? Aaron feared man and created a compromise. He said, okay, I'll, I'll keep the name of Yahweh, but I'll make this calf so that the people are happy with it. And and maybe that'll be okay. Maybe that'll work. And God says no. In fact, God, Moses intercedes for the people of Israel because God's ready to just wipe them out at this point. Another thing to notice from this is you can tell who you worship by whom you attribute your salvation to. The children of Israel, Aaron makes the calf, and the children say, the children of Israel say, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Deliverance from the land of Egypt. That's that is the hallmark all throughout Scripture so far. After the Exodus, God keeps going back to this. He keeps saying, It is I, I am the one, I brought you out, I delivered you from the land of slave, the house of slavery, the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Deliverance, salvation is from Yahweh. And God says that again and again and again. It's like his, his calling card, his identification. This is me. I'm the one who did this. I delivered you. And now, blasphemy of blasphemies, they're looking at this cow that Aaron just made. That, that, that's your repurposed earrings, guys. But no, no, this is the God who brought us out of the land of Egypt. So who do you look, for for salva- look to for salvation? Salvate, there is no other name by which man may be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. It is a salvation issue, and who you look to for salvation tells you who you worship in your heart. So number one, compromised worship is corrupt worship, and number two, salvation is an indicator of worship. Where do we look for salvation? So if your bumper sticker says, believe in Trump... You know what? A lot of the people who say believe in Trump also keep saying, tomorrow we'll have a feast to Yahweh. A lot of the people who put their hope in princes 
and in political action, and in the conservative movement and the moral majority, still say, hey, tomorrow we'll have a feast to Yahweh. We're, we're, we're a Christian nation. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. But it's not enough to claim the name of God and reject his word, reject his authority, refuse to wait on him, his leadership, his power. That's what Aaron did. He feared man, and he compromised. And that is the church's job today, is to not fear the world around us and cobble together some sort of half-Christian, half-biblical, half-worldly, half-acceptable, mangled mess, which God calls corrupt. Our job is to proclaim, no, 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 thus says the Lord, the real Lord, Jesus Christ, Yahweh, the one who actually delivers, the one in whom truly is salvation. Return to his word, repent, and be saved. He is a God who saves, but he is a God who does not share glory with another. There is salvation in no other name, no other political party, no president, no golden calf. There is only salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are called to proclaim as the church. So as we talk about political involvement and cultural involvement, we should. Because Jesus is Lord of everything. We should be involved in every sphere of life, proclaiming God's truth. But that is the issue. We are involved proclaiming God's truth. Proclaiming a return to obedience to the King. The King, Jesus Christ. They forsook the word of God. Aaron forsook the direct command of God. Don't make a graven image. It was disobedience for him to make the golden calf. May it not be said of us that we forsook the word of God and compromised with the philosophies that are in our day and age. The children of Israel said, make us a God who will go before us. What did the children of America say? Well, the God of the Old Testament was too harsh, or, you know, Paul hated women, or we need to have more racial justice, or fill in the blank. There's all sorts of things that are being clamored for in our culture today. So how do we respond as Christians? Well, first and foremost and primarily, we respond by saying, thus saith the Lord. We will not move from where Scripture speaks clearly. I recently shared a John Piper quote on Facebook. Bethany and I are reading... This Momentary Marriage. It's a book by John Piper about marriage. And the quote, something, the, the context, he was talking about the husband's role to protect his wife. And he said, your wife may be a black belt in karate, but if there, something goes bump in the night, you, be, you're the, you go check it out. That's your job, because you're the man. And she can go ahead and whip out her karate and beat the guy down, but only after you're laying unconscious on the floor. And if you do anything less than that, you are no man. And then he, he, but the quote that I posted was uh, something along the lines of, woe to the man and to the nation that sends its women to fight its battles. That's what I posted on Facebook. And I just reaped the whirlwind in the comments (laughs) of Christians, primarily. Like, but, but, but Deborah, but Deborah. Okay, yes, yeah, Deborah is in the Bible, and it's interesting because you look in, in children's Bibles, and how is Deborah portrayed? She's got a spear in her hand, and she's rushing into battle at the front of the, the, the armies of Israel. There is not a word in the text of Scripture about Deborah being involved in the combat. Amen. There's not a word. She, it, she goes up to the battle. The impression I get is that she probably was at some, the command tent somewhere. She's kind of standing there representing God among among the, the commanders, there's no mention of her rushing into battle. But then, okay, but then the next example is jail. Look, the jail's in the Bible. She, she killed Sisera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she was home, and Sisera came by, and she recognized him as an enemy of the Lord and used her hospitality to comfort him and let him lay down and take a nice nap, and then, bam, took him out with some homemaking implements. <laughs> And if your, if your vision of, of Christian homemaking womanhood doesn't include that, then we're missing something. Amen. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a mighty woman. That's a strong girl. She wasn't messing around. She knew how to swing a hammer. I mean, I mean, think about that. This is a trained warrior. If you miss, 
You accidentally bonk him on the forehead instead? That's it. That's the end. You know, this, that's a brave girl. Brave woman, strong woman, but certainly not a woman rushing into combat. So it's just incredible how we are compromised with the philosophies of our world. And if we are not careful to stand on the word of God and say, no, keep your earrings, there's only salvation in the name of of Yahweh, in the name of Jesus Christ. We will not compromise. We will not make a false gospel. We will not bring in the ideologies of the world. That is a battle we have to fight. That is hard to do. It's easy, even subconsciously, even accidentally, to be compromised by the milieu that constantly just floods over us of egalitarianism, Marxism, social justice, quote-unquote, And before too long, we stop thinking in biblical terms and we start trying to square scripture with the ideas that are all around us. And it's not, it's not a big leap. It's not hard to do. It just takes a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there. And before long, I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. And God says, they have corrupted themselves. May that not be said of us. May we continue to proclaim and to stand firm. Thus saith the Lord. Jesus is the king and I will not budge from this book. Oh, that the church would say that with courage. Um, Add on, bringing it home, by the way of bringing it home, um, the criteria that we can use, those of us who would never wear the bumper sticker, I believe in Trump, the criteria we can use to diagnose where our true belief is when uh, we hit uh, disappointment. How, what does the worshiper of God feel when his, you know, how does our, how does our heart reveal our true belief? Mm-hmm. When Trump is uh, ousted, are we put into confusion? Right, yep, yeah. Is my heart trembling inside or am I, uh, I feel in the same way as when um, it looked like he was the means of uh, God's blessing right. for another four years. Yep. Did my attitude change? And if so, I was wearing that bumper sticker in my heart, even right. though I would not admit it. Yep. Amen. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that ties into your church practice, too, because, you know, Aaron builds the calf. Why? You know, maybe it's for the same reason that Saul offered the sacrifices before Samuel arrived. Like, I don't want the people to scatter. I've got to, I've got to hold God's people together. No, you don't. That's not That's your right. job. That's right. Your job is to honor Christ. Period. And he will build his church. That is our job. Now, I would only add that we all like to see ourselves as a hero. Sorry. We're fine. We all like to see ourselves as a hero in the story. That's not what we want to do. We want to make sure we want to make sure that we're saying this really applies to me. What are the areas in which I have compromised? It's easy to say I've never made a golden calf. I hope you haven't. That would be awful silly. I mean, it would, in our society it would look ridiculous. But how many times have we come up in the past year and said had so had a brother or sister confront us and say, "Where'd you get that idea?" And we couldn't bring that idea, back it up with scripture. The idea of going to college, maybe. Or the idea of not homeschooling. I, I think COVID is one of the best things I've said before to happen to public school. It's just great. And the idea that parents all of a sudden were forced to consider homeschooling is just great. Okay, where in the first place did we get the idea that we should send our children to school? Because it didn't come from Deuteronomy 6. Things like that, okay? Things re- re-examine things that we've not examined before. Is it really that important for your son to be able to, or your daughter to go to the prom? You know, these kinds of things that, that we've not, they need re-examined, right? We need to be able to say, I'm not the hero, don't let, my, don't let me put myself up as the hero right off the bat. Let me examine where I'm coming from. And be able to back it up with scripture. And that application goes both directions too. Because on one hand you have compromise with worldliness. 
in the um, the popular ways of worldliness, the leftist ideologies and so on. But then there's also a compromise on the other side, where it's, I don't wear masks, and I don't really have a good biblical reason for it. I'm just being proud and stubborn. Yeah. You know what? That's just as much trust in a golden calf of my own, my own libertiness, or whatever you want to say. Right. That's still not trust in Christ. We can make that error in fighting against ungodly ideologies by responding in the flesh Amen. and in our pride and still not coming from Scripture, still not having a humble heart, still not relying on the Lord. Amen. So, this is ultimately about seeking deliverance in the name of Christ and no other name. That is where our hope is, that is where our faith is, and that is why we stand firm on God's Word and try everything by it.